ever wondered what it feels like to attend a FIFA World Cup match? Well, how about an entire World Cup tournament? The month-long tournament takes place every four years and most football fans dream of being part of it and ticking off one thing in their bucket list. My guests today, Bernard and Mukami, enjoyed the once-in-a-lifetime experience in Rio and Moscow respectively. Thinking of attending the next tournament in Qatar or the following tournament in USA and Canada, then you are in the right place as Bernard Ndong and Mukami Wambora tell us how it feels like. Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel for tournament. everything football. Something new today, I always say this is the channel for everything football because I literally bring for you guys everything football, literally. And I have two guests with me today to help me through the World Cup experiences. Let me introduce them first. How are you, Bernard? How are you? Good evening. Good evening. I'm good. I'm good. And Kami, how are you? Hey, what's up? I'm good. I'm good. Um, so I've always wanted to do this um, share to like talk to people who've experienced the World Cup before. It's something I've wanted to do like not for a very long time, but like since last year, January or something that was January of 2020. And I've always wondered what it feels like and I have the two perfect guests with me. After I checked out the, the experiences, I fell in love with like more in football, like I fell more in love with football. And um, I'm just going to be talking to, uh, to them about the experiences at the World Cup and um, I hope they share everything with us and uh, it can help you in the future in case you want to attend the 2022 World Cup, in case you want to attend the 2026 World Cup in any future World Cups. I hope this video is relevant for you. So Bernard, I'll start with you since uh, your World Cup was first in 2014. Can you describe to us um, what you felt like when you were picked to cover the World Cup? Okay, um, attending the 2014 World Cup, I must say it was, uh, I was a bit scared. Uh, I, you know, for, for any sports journalist covering a major sporting yeah. event like the World Cup, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something, uh, it's like a, a big tick in your yeah. TV. So I was a bit scared because I did not know what to expect. Uh, you're in a foreign country for about 30 days. Um, yeah. But for me, I, I guess I felt a bit more uh, comfortable because I had gone for about two weeks, seven day, ten days prior in May before the World Cup started in July, just to do what we call reke, in short reconnaissance, just to get a feel of um, the, in terms of logistics, in terms of accommodation, in terms of just knowing your way around. Um, because I remember the World Cup was being hosted in 12 cities in Brazil. And um, we had to just get a sense of which city we thought would be practical to stay in and just pitch camp there. So we opted to, to set base in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, about five matches, including the final and opening ceremony, would be held, or which we held there. So that reconnaissance kind of helped to assuage my fears. Um, so that helped. And then uh, we went in May, then came back, and then went again in June, now when the World Cup started. Um, I guess for me it was it was it was a surreal experience. It's something I'll never forget. Um, that month and a few days was something I'll never forget. That must have been that must have been very crazy. In case you're wondering who he who, what he means by we, it's him and that guy in the picture, Brian Baraka. If I'm not wrong, it's him. A brilliant, brilliant guy in camera work and stuff. So, yes. Mukami. How about you? Um, do you remember where you were when uh, you got the news that you're going to cover the World Cup? Of course, you had brought the, the World Cup trophy a few months before. Yeah, uh, the thing is, with the World Cup, the first World Cup I attended was actually the 2010 World Cup, the one in South Africa. And, you know, the reason I decided to go for that one was because it was so close to home. In my head, I was like, if there's ever a World Cup you need to attend, it has to be the one in Africa because South Africa is just here. So I made sure I saved up for that one, attended it. And then it was such an incredible experience that I told myself, like, you know what? If you can, you're going to try and go for every single World Cup that you're alive. Like that became like my goal. So um, 2014 did the same thing. And then now when I was at the 2014 World Cup, I said, you know what? Someone is going to pay you to go for this World Cup. You're not going to be using your own cash to go for the World Cup. And, you know, four years later, working at um, Citizen, and Bernard prepared me for it. He told me, like, as soon as I got hired, he was like, you know, you're going for the World Cup in 2018. And this was, like, uh, September 2017. 
So I had like those months to be like, okay, we need to go for the World Cup. And as he said, the pressure that I felt, because I had gone through some of the stories he did, Mike did for 2010 and Bernard did for 2014. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is, this is hectic. So um, I, to say like, I, I was excited, yes, but I was way more nervous than I was excited when I was now going to cover it in terms of work. It was scary. It was really scary. But I can tell you I was freaking out. We had to start yeah. like doing a plan in the office because I was like, what am I going to do for 30 days? It's too much pressure. Yeah, that was <laughs> you and um, Betty and Carol going to pick up the trophy from, um, was it, um, where was it again? Addis Ababa. Yeah, and uh, I'm assuming it was very nice, like having that experience and also traveling. You're very lucky you've gone to three World Cups. That is crazy. But the others you attended as a fan and the other one for work, yeah. which, yeah, and you're not the only one who'd love to get paid for football. I'd love to get paid for football. That's that's like a dream. So, um, Bernard, you said um, you went like a couple of weeks earlier. So, um, what, what was your decision on it after, after you, like, did whatever you did um, for two, three weeks? What was the decision I need to know to take on Brazil? Um, okay, when we did the reconnaissance, as I mentioned, uh, it helped us just to get a sense of uh, what to prepare ourselves in terms of logistics. Uh, for us, once we identified where we were going to pitch camp, um, we also tried to just get a feel, because our responsibility is ideally to, make, to, to, to create content, generate content, so we those 10 or 10 days or so when we were there we were able just to set base just try to look out look out for some interesting stories that we could work on because bottom line aside from the results aside from the games yes the matches are captivating but there's a lot of activity that happens behind the scenes there's a lot of a bit yeah. more interest in the, the action on the pitch so that really really helped us to get a sense of what to do and what to expect uh, and also in terms of um, logistics, uh, what was important was how we were going to be moving from one point to the other. Because where yeah. we were still, we were privileged to find somewhere where we could stay near the Copacabana beach. And that is also where we had, uh, the FI where there was the FIFA Fan Fest. That's where fans and uh, sometimes some of the football stars come to just interact and mingle with the fans. And even watch the matches. For those who are not able to get tickets to go and watch the games in the stadiums, that's a, an opportunity just to get that same atmosphere. So just to get a feel of knowing where, where is what, and the media center is almost around uh, where we were staying. And then um, also just the basics where we'll be having our meals, uh, because uh, aside from working, you, you need to ensure you have the energy to work, because you're working crazy hours. Remember Brazil yeah. was, was about five hours uh, behind, so yeah. it was crazy schedule. So for example, if it's eight in the morning in Brazil, that's 1 p.m. Kenyan time, and we had a, a magazine show that was airing at around 1.30 p.m. Kenyan time. So we had to make sure we were up very early and uh, we had to prepare ourselves way, way earlier than usual. So these are that, some of the things that we needed to prepare ourselves beforehand. And then as the days progressed, um, we, we just did what we could do within our abilities. Because bottom line, you can plan for everything and anything can happen. Uh, you can yeah. feel, you can, you, can ex you, can feel, you can think that you have everything planned out, but a lot of things can happen. Uh, for example, I fell ill, uh, I think, because I'd worked about 27 days or so. So one weekend I had to take a break because I fell ill, uh, I guess because of the pressure, because of the crazy schedules. Uh, so that th these are some of the things you need to anticipate. But I just want to maybe add, add value to this interview. I'm sure you're talking, you want to get our experiences as, as journalists, but also it's important for, for you to get uh, my observation as a, as a fan as well, because as much as you're going to cover a sporting event, you also to some extent as a fan, because you're, in the, you're, you're experiencing a World Cup with something else, even an Olympics, a major sporting event. We, you're there working, but also to some extent you're a fan. So yeah. you, you talked about costs um, briefly. I, I think what I picked up from was from a couple of Kenyans who had gone to watch the World Cup in 2014. Uh, so what they had done is they had traveled to the 2010 World Cup in South Africa. So after the experience in South Africa, uh, they, they had actually saved up four years prior to going to South Africa. So in 2006, remember the 2006 World Cup was in Germany. So four yeah. years later, they saved up. Uh, they started saving, I think, from day one, 2010, uh, until by the time it reached 2014, they were able to have accumulated a, a, at least enough funds to be able to 
participate uh, in the World Cup. Uh, I can see there are some photos of us uh, in the airport. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, in the plane. In the plane. Um, yeah. So basically, what, what one thing those people did is that they were able to save up for all that for about four years, and mm -hmm. uh, that helped to cushion like the expenses which because the biggest expense is usually I'm sure Mukami will tell you the same is the flight. Flight is usually a, 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 big, a huge cost, and also accommodation because you can't just travel to another country where there's a major sporting event happening and just stay there for, for a week. It defeats logic. It, it, you'll not fully appreciate the experience of the World Cup. So for this, uh, for this group of guys, they saved up and then they were able to stay in Brazil, I think, for about two or three weeks. Uh, and they traveled to about three or two venues uh, mm -hmm. for, to just watch the matches and just have to have a proper, proper plan. So if you're able to have some resources and you really, really want to go for the World Cup, like in 2022 for Qatar, you need to have started saving two years prior. Yeah. So, Mukami, you've experienced both sides as a fan and um, as a journalist. Which one would you say is better, going to a World Cup as a fan, just experiencing it as a fan or doing some work and um, sharing your experience with people back home? Uh, I don't, it's, there's, there's two different sides to it because going as a fan was fun obviously like for me the brazil experience was amazing because as bernard said started saving up for it in like 2012 um and managed to get the tickets early to save on costs and early means um january i got it on the january and they cost eighty thousand. i was going with a friend of mine saved up to get to watch the games at least three games and then the good thing if you're buying them from fifa.com you're getting them at sale value and even if you don't get them from FIFA, there's usually ticket exchanges that happen on Facebook and you can do that. And, yeah. you know, the atmosphere is crazy because, you know, everyone is there to, because you all love football. So there's mm -hmm. that whole aspect. You all love football, so you're there to watch. And it was, it, it was really crazy because everyone is in a friendly atmosphere, a friendly mm -hmm. mood and all of that. So, and then you're going to the, if you can't watch the games and the match, so you're saying you go uh, at the stadium, rather you go to the fan fest and you like party the whole time, um, which was fun. But now for work, it was a different kind. It was fulfilling. Let me say that. It was crazy, hectic. Like I barely slept most of the time I was there because you, um, fortunately in Russia, it's the same time as Kenya. So. Yeah. Seven is seven, nine is nine. So just waking up early, preparing for the World Cup band show, which was every weekday at 1.30, and then starting to go look for the stories, prepare them. So in those 30 days, other than the games I watched, like I didn't go out much, um, we were working nonstop. It was super hectic. But at the end of it, it was really like, yo, you did it. Like, you did it. You did the stories. I got um, some good feedback from especially people at work. So it was fulfilling. But then, yeah, um, yeah. so it's, it's different sides of, of the coin. But then, yeah, obviously, I'm even thinking now, Qatar. <laughs> like, they want to work. <laughs> <laughs> you 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 were so happy you went on to do the Drake challenge at the end of the tournament. We did see that. We did say that that's that's why you're so happy after being so happy. So Bernard, um how hard is it to like um get stories like um I'll bring it up right now, like work and get stories like that. How hard is it to plan stories like that? Well, um I think for me, um I'm a stickler for planning. Um uh, yeah, that's a personal trait and uh, I don't like jumping to a into a situation where I have not planned myself accordingly. So for this particular story, um, I was actually the first Kenyan journalist to interview a FIFA official. This was actually the head of the local organizing committee uh, yeah. for the FIFA World Cup. So the thing is you have to visualize uh, uh, tentative content. Uh, so anything yeah. you feel that might be captivating or interesting to the viewers and the listeners or the guys who will be reading your stories on the website, you have to really, 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 really research hard. Uh, that's what yeah. I did um, when I was uh, when we went for the record in May. Uh, by the time we went for the one month, I was still researching, looking at tentative stories. Because what happens is you're able to visualize um, uh, stories, uh, features that will be able to give you a cutting edge. Because bottom line, we are a very uh, 
you, you know, the, our industry is very, it's, it's very unfair to some extent because if you, you, you can be have consistent and loyal viewers, but if you don't have information or, or stories that are captivating, it's, mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just a switch. Same for your page. If, somebody, if you don't have things that are captivating or interesting, somebody can easily click on something else and they watch whatever they want to watch. And, yeah. and with time, you'll notice the numbers are dwindling. Uh, it's the same for our industry. So for me, what I did is uh, I, I, I would research a lot. Uh, I would look at anything that I would fi find fascinating. I, I, sent a, I sent a lot of emails, like finding, getting, getting that interview with that FIFA official. Uh, he was an, okay, so he was not, a, okay, he was a, to some extent he was, he was not for FIFA per se, he was part of the local organizing committee, but I guess for that particular time, he was to some extent a FIFA official because we managed at least to go inside and see how they were doing things behind the scenes. We were able to see how the tickets were going to be distributed and just give me a sense of the logistics behind organizing a World Cup. So yeah. as from the point of view of the host country. So yeah. for me, I, I always... For example, let me give you a tentative example. If if I'd be going to Tokyo for the 2020, uh, 2021 or 2020 Olympic Games, um, I will start doing my research immediately. I'll start looking at things that people might find fascinating because yeah. aside from uh, the action on the pitch, aside from the action uh, in the stadiums, there's a lot that happens behind the scenes, as I've mentioned. Uh, like I remember there's a story I did. One of my st stories that really stood out for me was I, when I met uh, a, a Brazilian who makes replica trophies, mm. uh, most people don't realize the, the, the hassles that we go through because I had to hire a translator because he mm. obviously couldn't speak English. You're, you're in a country where they speak Portuguese. So I yeah. had to look out look for a, a translator. Of course, that has, that has uh, cost implications, but I planned for that as well. Because if mm. you're, especially for an event where the, the main language in that country is not English, you have to look at what will you do? I'm sure from Kami as well, when she went to Russia, she, she had to look for a plan to be able to uh, capture a story and get the, the testaments of an individual who is a national, who is a national from that country, but he's able to be translated in a way that you feel that whatever they wanted to say and whatever they wanted to share is, is it's, you can still, it, it, it feels personal because it's difficult, it's not easy. So these are things you also have to factor in when it comes to your content. So for me, I had to look at that as well. So like that particular story of that man who made trophies, uh, it really stood out for me, but I'd done my research. Uh, I found another story of an old man who, who, had, uh, who was, a, who was a, like a huge fan of a club. I don't know if you watched the story. Uh, yeah. He was like 60 years plus and he had tattoos of his club. So if you're a fan of, you said you're a fan of Arsenal, I'm guessing. Yeah. And uh, so, clearly, you, you, you might also be a fan of Arsenal, but uh, in disguise, we can also say that. <laughs> Maybe I'm a fan of Newcastle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you have tattoos of your club. So he had tattoos all over his body of his favorite club. So I started like that. I did my research. So as much as it had been done before, um, I needed to give it a personal, uh, a personal feel so that for the Kenyan viewers, uh, for people who would want to know, like, oh, wow, okay, this is actually a fan who, who has taken his passion to another level where he has tattoos mm -hmm. of his club. So... What is very key uh, for me, especially when you're going to cover a major sporting event, and even locally, uh, if there's any major sporting event that's happening, it's always look at what else can you do on the sidelines? What, is, what can you find that will make viewers feel a wholesome experience? Because it's more than the action of the pitch. I always yeah. reiterate that. Because anyone can do that. I can comfortably tell you, uh, go and follow up on tonight's match, Arsenal versus Newcastle. You get, you'll obviously just yeah. get the benefits, the results and all that. But what if I was to tell you, okay, do this. What if you find out and look out for a fan who's mm -hmm. attended each and every match uh, for the past 10 years? You understand? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody who lives and breathes an arsenal. You know, that's something that people find captivating. Yeah. Or even somebody who's worked at Arsenal from the time they used to play at Highbury, the other stadium, then they moved to, to this other, like somebody who's worked at both facilities. You, you know, something like that, somebody would think, okay, that's fascinating. Or, or even where the history of that logo where it came from so you have, mm -hmm. you always have to ask yourself okay fine what angle can i can i can i can i follow up on that would give my uh my uh, content an extra edge that's always has to be yeah. in the back of your mind yeah tough work and come you will come to the language barrier thing but i wanted to ask you first of course you also got a story with a with a resident in russia with in russia who was kenyan how did you manage to get that planned <laughs> 
you know, some of these stories are purely coincidental. Um, with Bernard, before I left, we planned quite a bit. And I realized for me, the planning was more to put me at ease rather than, um, because out of all the stories we had actually planned for, I think I only did three or four of, of, of those. And with yeah. this lady, I was actually staying in, um, with the embassy, um, a Kenyan who works at the Russian embassy, in the Kenyan mm -hmm. embassy in Russia, in the Kenyan embassy mm -hmm. in Russia. So um, she just happened to be coming into the house and cleaning and we started speaking and she was telling me, yeah, I'm actually from Kenya. I was there the other day, you know, actually Larry Mado is my cousin. And I was like, oh, oh that's interesting. Like, okay, let's start talking. Yeah. Well, how did you end up in Russia? How did you, um, when was the first time you went to Kenya? And she just told me her story and I was just like that, like a lot of people would, would want to to hear hear about that. And um, yeah, so it's, it, it was just one of those that just happened like, hey, what's up, how are you doing? And then you're like, oh, okay, that's interesting. Okay, I think we can, we can do a story. And she was very open to it. And you know, telling us about her her dad and um, you know her mom and how they met in um, in school and stuff. So it was it was it was cool. Yeah. Um. What were you thinking during that trip to? Well, where did you go first before going to Russia? Where did you land first? Where did I? Um, La land. Yeah, land first. Uh, we were in Istanbul. We our stopover. So what were you thinking the moment you landed in Istanbul? Like, this is it? I was panicking. I was literally panicking. And I was just telling myself, oh, my gosh. Like, if you mess up, what's going to happen? Like, these guys have put your trust in. Like, they put their trust in me. There's so mm. much pressure. I've never done a big assignment. But the, bringing the World Cup trophy was the, the only assignment I'd done out of the country and it already felt like so much stress and I remember I had to do that story under so much pressure and literally running to give the director the story and at the end of it my boss Mike told me like you know what that's how every day in Russia is going to be and so now I just felt just a lot of pressure. Honestly, I wasn't like that excited. I was just like, you have so much to live up to. How are you going to do this? Like, you know? Yeah. So it was more scared. Like I was, I was really scared, honestly. I was super scared until I did the first story and I did the first link um, and it was on Jeff Koinange Live. And yeah. like after that, I was like, okay, that wasn't so bad. That wasn't mm -hmm. so bad. You can you can do it like you know yeah. and then every day you just start getting more and more confident and then when you find stories that you are in like those interesting stories that you find like we found a tournament that was happening in the center fifa foundation and the kenyan teams were playing in it and we hadn't gotten like badge clearance for it but then now just smooth talking like oh my gosh kenya my country we have to represent please let us in and then you uh, when we got in there we saw roberto carlos um he was he was doing an interview and like once you start churning out the stories you get more and more confident and yeah. then that psych propels you forward and you know you just get going basically okay so the moment you get the, the send it back home or do you like send the the just the the footage how does it work so once you've shot and recorded and edited the story we yeah. used to use um we transfer so yeah. just send it or google just google mail honestly <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> and then yeah shout out to the so, two people that you worked with um jacob and is it jedi yeah, it's yeah and jadida jd yeah, yeah. they were yeah, the yeah. best honestly um we had such a good time such hard workers like for isia especially because he came as part of radio and print and yeah. on the first day mike tells him you're going to be doing so he'll get ready go so <laughs> he had like no time to prepare and yeah. he killed it. He totally killed it. And to think he had like 
twice as much work because he had to wake up in the morning, package his voice, his radio stuff, and then still write articles. Um, and then, you know, I was only helping him with the editing. He was writing his own Swahili scripts. Um, and, you know, hey, and then JD was, she's so easy to work with and she's so creative. And that's what I loved about it. We're very collaborative. It wasn't, um, you do this, you do that. It'll be like, okay, I think we can do this. Maybe take it from this angle. And, you know, we were feeding off of each other. And JD surprisingly is an awesome cook. So she's the one, once the, she's given us all of the footage, she used to go and cook. We like we're just eating ugali. It wasn't even like Russian food. <laughs> just yeah. ugali. And me and um is yeah, like trying to work hard to get the stories in for seven and nine. So yeah, yeah they're such an awesome team. Okay, and uh, Bernard, how was how how was it working with uh, Barack? Of course, he's a legend. Like how was it working with him? Um with uh, Brian, it's actually Baraka, not Baraka. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So with Brian, um, I think just to pick up from what Mukami said, uh, what is very critical is you have to have, because um, you know it's a partnership. Uh, yeah. You feed off each other's energy and um, you have to be very strategic in who you choose to travel with because you're going to spend an extended period of time with an individual. So if you yeah. don't, you're not on the same wavelength, it can be a bit of a challenge because people are different. People have different personalities, people have different... Uh, uh, people operate differently, especially under pressure. So you have to learn how to to be able to pick out somebody. Or because you can imagine, your you, like Mukami was in Russia for almost for a month. I was in Brazil mm -hmm. for a month. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if I'd not uh, had a rapport with him uh, prior to leaving the country, it would have been a bit difficult to spend each and every day because you know you're spending each and every day with this individual. So. Yeah. When you're not working, you're socializing together. So you, mm -hmm. the, when, when it, there's that downtime, for example, if you've already we've sent our report back to Kenya, uh, we're just relaxing and chilling, we'll be watching something, or we want to go have dinner, or we want to do something, you won't be talking about work per se. You talk about other things. Because also if you think about work the entire time, you'll go nuts. Uh, yeah. So it's usually preferable you try and strike a balance. Um, mm -hmm. As much as you're, you're expected to deliver, you need that downtime is very critical in, having, in ensuring that peace of mind and uh, keeping you fresh and um, just distracting because at times we would have a free day and we'd go and have lunch, we'd go and tour. I'm sure you've seen that photo that you shared in the onset there. We went to the, the Corcovado. That is the Christ the Redeemer. Yes, that is what Mukami is showing. <laughs> uh, we yeah. went to the Christ the Redeemer. We went to other places as well. And even sometimes when we, because I remember the time we were walking to the, to the beach just to just unwind, uh, like Mukami said, sometimes a story might find you. I had those Kenyan bracelets because I don't have it now. So yeah. I was waiting for Brian. I think he had taken his laundry to, to a laundromat there, to a laundry just for his clothes and stuff. And then uh, I, was, I was waiting for him outside. Some gentleman just walked up to me. Uh, I think he was a Brazilian national. Then he asked me, are you guys from Kenya? He's like, yes, we are. Then he quickly switched to Swahili. I was really shocked mm -hmm. because I was thinking, okay, um, are you Kenyan? Because his complexion was obviously, he wasn't Caucasian. And mm -hmm. he was speaking Swahili. He was very, it was almost similar to, a, I would say it's somebody from Mombasa. But then now he explained to me that he was actually Brazilian and then he traveled to, Tan to Tanzania several years prior and he'd uh, worked as a tour guide and then he'd come to Kenya briefly. So he learned Swahili when he was there. So of course my, your instincts kicked in quickly and I was like, hey, give me your contacts. I think your story is very interesting. And mm -hmm. we, we plan for a for a day. Yeah. To also ensure that uh, that uh, the authenticity of that story, because most people think that this is just a random Kenyan I got in the streets of Brazil. So he had to actually get for us his Brazilian ID. Uh, just I think also Bra something is Brazilian passport or something like that, just to show us that indeed he was Brazilian. So yeah. Sometimes for us, uh, you might also be just be relaxing, uh, just unwinding, and then we're always on our toes because anything can happen. Because yeah. I remember the time uh, we were heading back to the hotel um, after after dinner, and we found guys fighting in the streets. Um, mm -hmm. Just it was just so random. I had my phone. I quickly started recording with my phone, and I knew that's yeah. something I'll factor in in another story that I did about uh, how insecurity is at night. 
how, how it feels because they, apparently there are fans who travel all the way to Brazil to go and sleep on the beach. And there's a yeah. story we did about crime that that it was very interesting. Uh, there was a guy we found, unfortunately, being robbed. So we got it all on camera. Uh, so yeah. sometimes you're just in the right place at the right time, but you always have to keep your eye out. You always have to keep your ears open. Uh, enjoy yourself as well, but you have to learn how to strike a balance. And the thing is, it's just work smart because for us, we usually try as much as possible to uh, put in pressure as much as possible so that when you're winding down to the coverage, you're able to get at least uh, a few days to be able to unwind uh, and also just to, uh, by the time you, you come back to Kenya, you're not completely, it's not such a, such a significant shift because you can imagine you're coming from five hour difference back to, to the normal time and then the atmosphere, the climate, the food, the language, and everything, you can, you can actually mess with your, your entire psyche. So that is very critical, how to strike that balance. Yeah. For the poor individual, let's just rephrase that to wrong place at the right time for the poor individual. <laughs> uh, yes. Mukami, Mukami um, I also wanted to ask you about, um, there's, a, there's a tweet I saw you um, having on Twitter, and uh, you talked about you have to be there to experience what what it is like and don't hear what people are saying. So before you went to Russia, obviously there were stories about racism and everything. So is there any time that you were scared of going there and you're like, oh, wow, people are not actually going, people have refused to go? Is there any time that you felt that way? Um, you had the stories and everything, but something else I realized about the World Cup is the atmosphere is a bit different because there's, it's a melting pot of cultures. There's so many different people. So you won't only meet the the people in that country. So that yeah. helps a lot. But then uh, for me, it was amazing. We were well received. In fact, we were like celebrities with our hair. You know, me and JD, everyone wanted to stop and take pictures with us. You know, like they're not used to seeing black people that often actually so if i felt more of a celebrity in russia than i do even here in kenya because <laughs> yeah. i was photo 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 yeah um and they were really nice i i think what usually happens is i guess for more for the men than the women and mm -hmm. for like the students that we spoke to say that for them, they have to be very careful. Like the black students that we managed to speak to that are Kenyan and are black, were saying yeah. like, you can't go clubbing uh, by themselves. They have to go in groups um, and, you know, little things like that. But then in Moscow, I don't think it's as bad as in, as in the other parts of Russia, the more rural areas. So, and things have changed a lot, but then I, for women, it, it it didn't feel that way. I didn't feel unsafe. I used to we used to travel at night all the time on the on like you know with the trains and stuff. And I think also maybe Putin told them behave like the whole world's eyes are on us, so they were like yeah. told yes, we don't yeah. want any scandals. So maybe they were just being on the best behavior. But then the Russian people themselves, like when I was doing a story about that, like especially with England, because, you know, they have a checkered history with England and that clashed um, in the Euros a few years earlier. Um, they were saying they, they they were welcomed. And, you know, the Russians themselves, as they were struggling to speak English, were saying, like, this is propaganda. It's the politics. Like, us on the ground, we want visitors. You guys come to Russia. We love having people here. And, you know, they were very warm and welcoming. And, like, I didn't... It's weird. I didn't feel... I didn't feel unwelcomed in the country like the entire time you know um in fact i was thinking i was going to get kidnapped like you're walking the street come lady come come <laughs> you know and they're struggling to speak in in english but yeah uh, i didn't get that sense the whole time i was there so my personal experience was that it was cool so what was your what was the hardest experience there was it the waking up to get stories was it um the weather was it um, the being being too careful? What was the hardest experience there, or challenge? Well, Russia was it was basically Nairobi. Honestly, the weather was the same. The time was literally the same. I think the biggest challenge was communication because 
there no one spoke english like it's very rare to find like russians who speak english and the ones who could speak could speak only a little so even taxi drivers when we used to have to use the taxi or trying to get um directions it was really hard you had to use like google translate so you have to type it in english it translates in russian you show them they look at the phone they're like oh okay then they type in russian they give it back to you it translates so it was taking so much more time to try and um get something across um so i think that would that was the most difficult thing just that then inability to like really communicate with with people with yeah. russian specifically yeah it's very fascinating because people individuals actually just sit down and get the final story but they don't know what has actually happened through what they did and stuff so banad how about you like was it um, you've actually mentioned about the the crime and everything at the beginning and being scared but you were scared because of the reports and everything was that time that you were scared about the crime then you are, you are kind of thinking twice about going there um that's true uh, because in the build up to the world cup in 2014 uh, there was a lot of issues in terms of um, a lot of brazilians were were torn between some who were supporting um, the country hosting the, the world cup and others who thought that it was uh, it was unnecessary uh, spending so much so much so much money to build yeah. all those stadiums uh, all that infrastructure and everything and yet of course it has its own the country has its own challenges there's a lot of disparities between the the rich and the poor so yeah. a lot of protests i remember the first day actually when we landed we were in the midst of a protest but it wasn't as violent as as as, as i had seen before because there were a lot of incidents where there was a bit uh, things be- went a bit south but mm-hmm. uh, that was my concern but i, I wasn't too re- i wasn't it didn't give me much discomfort per se uh, yeah. because there was a lot of security everywhere so at any point it was any protest or anything that uh for the seemed like a protest there were a lot of security officers around um yeah. uh the only time that i felt a bit scared was the day when we captured that man being robbed uh, on the beach uh because mm-hmm. what what happened exactly was we were standing on the side of the beach and then now we saw that this guy was sleeping on the beach and then somebody walked up to him and started rummaging through his pockets so yeah. and the irony was that there was a police car that was just about 400 meters away but they were uh, they're not in the line of sight of what was happening on the beach and then mm-hmm. uh, we came talked about the language barrier so we, we were in two minds because we were asking ourselves okay fine if we go to the police officers how will we going how will we going to express how are we going to express ourselves how are we going to tell them there's an incident happening there because we obviously don't mm-hmm. speak portuguese and yeah. then secondly when we were capturing uh, what was happening uh, we noticed some two gentlemen across the road they were about like 400 meters from where we were standing pointing at yeah. us and we came yeah. to realize later that we were in cahoots with the guy who robbed from the other guy because he started pointing yeah. at us and we realized that uh we were recording what was happening so i had yeah. to tell my colleague uh, I, i think let's let's just get out of here because a story is good but you don't need to put your life at risk because mm-hmm. this is a country of course given the history of of of, of crime and and it's violent crime it's not just somebody mm-hmm. who will hit you or anything the likelihood of those of those guys having firearms was really really high so yeah and it was at night uh, we were just the only two on that stretch of the beach there were two of us and then a f- distance away was a police car and then that that individual he spoke to his colleague then he started walking towards where we are so yeah. i told my colleague to just walk off as much as brian was he was really buffed he was big and uh, intimidating but you, you don't know what this guy this other guy was approaching us was carrying so we decided let, let, let's just let's just let's just move away so we walked away very cautiously and we kept glancing back to see maybe the trail or anything like that um but thank god nothing nothing happened but that is the only time i actually felt scared because if anything would have happened to us then i don't know what I, it would be a totally different story yeah true the putting life at risk for for stories we really appreciate you come you any time you felt scared <laughs> and come you say anything you felt scared i'm trying to trying to remember mm-hmm. because you know the good thing is we were the three of us we were almost always together so like there was no situation we'd find ourselves that like that felt very dangerous or yeah or anything like that 
were very, yeah. yeah. I think it's just that power in numbers that we felt like we're always together. So, yeah. Mm. Okay, so for the final few minutes, let's talk about the football now, Bernard. Let's go to the let's go to the more positive things. So, Mkami, um, before the before the twenty eighteen World Cup, covering it, of course, you had been to the others, but what was your best World Cup before that, like in terms of football wise? Twenty fourteen. Oh, football ways. I don't like. <laughs> no, 2014 was definitely my best, the best World Cup I attended. Um, what I always do in terms of games, I try and watch the African teams. I always yeah. get the tickets for African teams. It's, it's so, it's usually Nigeria, um, Ghana, the last Senegal. So, last, the Ghana versus Germany game was pretty good. Like in, yeah. In Brazil, and we did really, really well. Um, yeah. I think it was a draw, it was like a two to draw, and the atmosphere in the stadium was crazy. Um, I think the Greece versus Ivory Coast game was, was also nice, and that's only because I managed to make it on TV. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> one of those people ah, captured on screen uh, with the yeah. makeup, but like, yeah, the games for me were the best part. I try and always do three games. I, I plan for that. You there are different tiers, like the uh, in terms of expenses, how close you want to be in the pitch and how far far away. But um, the atmosphere inside the stadiums are usually like the, the, like those nice. are the moments where you're just like this is why I watch the World Cup and this is why I want to go for every other World Cup after that. Like Bernard was saying, people plan, like they start saving like the day after the last World Cup ends and you meet the same people. Like I have friends that we only met in World Cup and we only talk when World Cup is coming and when we're there, like from Brazil, I was like, hey, Russia, where are you? Oh, we have the fun park. Let me come say hi. Because once it's addictive, it's very addictive. Yeah. To attend to attend the World Cup and um, those games particularly, you can't go all the way to the country and then you don't go and watch the football. So the it's just I don't know how to explain it. Everyone is on just another vibration. Everyone is in a good mood, and especially if you're with the same team. Even when your team loses, it's like you're all like sad together. So there's still yeah. that sort of camaraderie um, yeah. that that happens. So yeah. Yeah, Brazil for me though was the best. I think. I I, I thought twenty ten would be the best, the easiest answer because that one was absolutely fantastic. Bernard, I think you attended the Argentina Bosnia game if I'm not wrong. Like I I I don't know I don't know if you realize that this was like Messi's like best World Cup. So just being there is just crazy. So how was the experience of being there? Um, unmute your mic. Um, I think, I don't know how you can describe it. Um, you know, being in around that, I, I think for me, any, any match, especially that had Chilean fans, for me, mm. was such, such a, was such a vibe. I, I came to realize South American teams and uh, some of the African teams, they really, really know how to support their respective teams. They, yeah. they cheer from start to finish. Um, yeah. uh, I remember going to the stadium. I think it was a game. I can't remember where it was. Chile, I don't know and who. Um, mm -hmm. From the point, because we met them on the train, because the stadium yeah. was a bit of a distance. So the entire, you can imagine you're in a train and everyone is just saying, chi, 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 viva Chile. So mm -hmm. they sang that song until they reached the stadium of the Maracana and they sang from start to finish. But mm. a game I would also say really stood out for me. I think everyone knows that big game was the one between Germany and Brazil because mm -hmm. you can imagine <laughs> you mm -hmm. you are in the, you, somebody would say it's, Brazil is the mecca of football yeah you're in the mecca of football and obviously you're the home country you're the host country yeah. and uh, you're playing the previous hosts Germany yeah. most people didn't really expect it would be as because I think they had played USA and then they won by a goal yeah so no one really expected that's the kind of result that would have <laughs> would have been blaring on the screens. Uh, yeah. uh, it, 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 I can tell you, you know, it felt like because I was in, when that time I was still in Rio and the game was played in uh, is it there's a place I can't remember the city. I don't know it's Fortaleza. I think it was called Fortaleza. Mm -hmm. So 
once the final whistle was 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 blown, mm-hmm. you know it felt like like a very famous Brazilian had passed on. Yeah. I've never seen collective grief in an entire country. Yeah. You see the jersey that Mukami is, is hanging over there on her on her left. Yeah. So you, you could see people just using it to wipe their tears. You could see people just yeah. they could not believe it. They could not yeah. believe it. Like seven one. They could mm-hmm. not believe it. It was like a nightmare. They yeah. I'm telling you it was it was surreal because you almost were expected. Um, they, they were thinking, ah, it's this, you know, we are at home, it's the semifinals. We only go mm-hmm. up, we only have to beat Germany. I think they had beaten France. Uh, the Germans had beaten France one nil in the, in the quarterfinals, so they were confident. Yeah. But seven mm-hmm. one, they were completely bamboozled. Uh, yeah. I think uh, I, I was even very careful. Not even that day, I don't think I was able to get uh, as as many reactions as I usually get from Brazilians because everyone was refusing to speak. Uh, yeah. No one wanted to talk to us. The Germans obviously were very happy, um, but the few Brazilians we found, most of them were in tears. They could yeah. not believe it. I think for me that was the yeah. match that really stood out because it yeah. just tells you how unpredictable a World Cup can be. Um, yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why every four years we get to experience history being made. So if the World Cup was a biennial event, I don't think we'd be able to really appreciate how unpredictable, how entertaining, how enthralling it can be. So yeah. I, I, can't, I, I can't, I'm just waiting for 2022. I'm sure it will be another spectacle. Crazy. Of and course, I we, remember, we hope it goes through. I remember being um, in Rio when they were in the quarterfinals and me and like my travel, like my friend who I went with were praying they don't lose their game because mm-hmm. we knew like the, atm- it was our last night and we're like, God, the atmosphere will be so mm-hmm. low if these guys mm-hmm. lose. So when they won that game, and everyone was in a party mood. And like now, if we flew back to Kenya and then the 7 1 happened, we're just thinking, like, wow, we left right on time. <laughs> yeah. I feel like the World Cup ended on that day. Like, effectively, yeah. the, the World Cup must have ended on that day. <laughs> and yeah. So, as soon as we did text, there's, there's, it's funny enough, even to date, I still remember that song. There's a song, because you know, Argentina and Brazil bored each other. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> when Brazil lost, the Argentinians, uh, they, they, they coined a song. I actually know some of the words. I'm even surprised how I remember it to date. Because they were singing it everywhere in the streets. And then now, of course, Argentina qualified for the rich crowd. It was uh, Brazil, de si me que se siente, de ne, pasa tu papa. So translation in short was, Brazil, how does it feel being, long and short of it, being beaten at home? How does it feel? You're at home. You're the ones who are hosting this World Cup. How does it feel? So everywhere we went, <laughs> like even in the final, because we want yeah. to just get a, a feel of the atmosphere. That's what, they, what mm-hmm. every Argentinian was singing. Even though they have reached the final, they're facing off another team, but they're yeah. still taunting their neighbors. Because every time I hear yeah. Brazil and Argentina face off in a football match, it's really huge. It's a big, big yeah. spectacle. Because these yeah. are two rivals. They border each other. You, you know the rivalry in the Copa Sud America. So <laughs> I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. Yeah. yeah, it would have been so, an abomination if they won yeah. in Brazil. Honestly, yes. like they really don't like each other. They 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 <laughs> hate each other. Like it's not even their rivalry. It would have been so unfair if Germany lost. They were so brilliant in that World Cup. Four nil, seven one. So quick fire questions, Mkami. Your experience in Russia out of ten? Um, seven and a half. Seven and a half. Bernard in Brazil. Out of ten. I would say eight. Um, Kami, accommodation, accommodation in Brazil, out of ten in Russia, sorry. Oh, like I was lucky. I was staying um, like with a Kenyan, so for me it was a uh, like a ten out of ten. We had a really central location, someone who knew the place, who was so helpful. Like that, we yeah. were very fortunate. Bernard, out of ten, accommodation. Yeah, uh, accommodation. I'll give it a six. Mm-hmm. I know it was close oh, but- to the beach, but. Trust yeah. me, there are a lot of Our real accommodation is like a two or three. We were, and we <laughs> paid so much money to stay in the dangerest place in the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bernard, how about the food there? Food was amazing. I'll give it a 10 out of 10. And Kami, um, apart from the food that you were made for by your colleague, the Russian food itself? 
I didn't eat Russian food. Honestly, like I can't even. I did actually. I did not eat a single Russian meal. It's crazy. Yeah. Don't ask me how it happened. I was eating McDonald's. I I wasted yeah. that experience. But the Brazil food was nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and Bernard, um, how far are we and other African countries and maybe some Asian countries from hosting the World Cup? Uh, from, from the experience of 2010, yeah. um, I, I don't see it coming back to Africa after a long, long time. I think uh, we still have a long way to go. Uh, yeah. I, I think South Africa raised the bar for the entire continent. Yeah. So if yeah. we are to host the World Cup again, um, I, I feel the North African countries can get it right because I was privileged to participate in last year's, not participate, rather cover. I was not a player. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Afghan, Afghan. Ball boy, yes. ball boy. Yeah. <laughs> ball boy. Yeah. The African Cup of Nations in Egypt, and they actually held a very really entertaining uh, tournament. Uh, yeah. I think Cameroon is also hosting the Chan right now. Um, yeah. Maybe a North African or West African country because I know North Africans and East Africans really love their football and the stadiums will be full. Uh, yeah. East Africa, uh, I don't think we are there yet. I don't think we have the facilities, the logistics. Uh, it's, it's, let me tell you, hosting a World Cup is not a joke. Mm. Uh, it's, 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 it's not a joke. You have to have the new infrastructure because you can imagine, uh, for example, like Kenya, we have Kasarani, mm. 60,000 seater capacity stadium. Maracana is almost close to double that amount of amount of, of, of capacity. When the yeah. game is over, the entire stadium is clear in almost 10, 15 minutes. So there yeah. are trains nearby, the buses nearby. There's a, such a logistical, uh, it's such a logistical mess. So if you're not able to have such things at hand before, because most people think it's just the stadiums, that is not the only thing. You have to ensure that you have the hotels, you have the roads, yeah. you have, uh, uh, you have um, security, uh, because... You can imagine the number of people who are coming to your country at, 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 at that particular month. You're hosting a major yeah. sporting event. The logistics as yeah. well, the buses, the, 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 the tour, their families, the sponsors. So for Africa, I think maybe 2030 going forward, that's maybe the next time we might be hosting a World Cup again. My personal opinion. Asia wow. maybe might get it after Qatar. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I think that, I don't know, Mukami, are, are they deemed around Asia as well, Qatar? Somebody would deem, because I know they are yeah. part of the Asia... Federation. So, Next, to some extent, Plato and Mexico, Morocco so might. Morocco were close. Morocco were yeah, quite close yeah. to getting it. So, I, um, I, I kind of meant the the poor countries. No disrespect, the likes of yeah. India and Indonesia. Like, not they it, ever not also work? Not yet. Okay, I'm coming. Yeah. Finish it for us. Um, of course, you've been to Azerbaijan too for the Europa League final. Bernard has been to the Welcome Rugby Sevens World Cup. How far are we from hosting such events? eons if in my lifetime we can host i'll be happy we couldn't even host the african championship like just chan yeah. because our stadiums weren't ready which was going to be at least let's try and get this right and we couldn't so i think we're miles off maybe the next 10 years if we can at least get the stadiums right and this is just to host like african cup of nations like world cup i i don't have any faith <laughs> Let's aim for Afcon. It's very far. So make sure you follow Bernard and Kami. Their handles are scrolling down the bottom. And uh, Bernard, any other work they need to check out that you have? Uh, I think that's it. I think we've captured everything. Uh, yeah. My timeline is, um, is all over the place. So they'll see what I have to share on my social media platforms in case anyone else. Anything, any more information regarding uh, my experiences covering major sporting events, can yeah. send me a DM. Yeah, awesome. Kami? Yep, yep. Um, Glenn, you asked me to do this, and I'm working on it. I'm going to do a proper, proper, um, like, tips, pro tips to go and watch our World Cup. And I'll do yeah. that on my channel on YouTube, Mukami Ombora. So I'm going to do, like, a nice one. How much money do you need? How to save up? where to stay, how long should you plan, like all of those things. So if people have any questions, they can also throw them my way on my social yeah. media accounts, and then I'll try and accumulate them and, and, and do like a nice video. Thank you very much. Fascinating those stories. Uh, like in ages, you see all this, I had like a hundred questions written down, but yeah, for the, for the, for the purpose of the guests, 
Yeah, for Good the question. for the purpose of the, thank you the, for the purpose of people who are the guests and the people who are watching you don't want to be on stage for three hours. So thank you very much for coming on. So that was the World Cup experience of Mukami Wambora and um, Bernard Ndong in Rio and in Moscow. Of course, 2020 World Cup is just under two years to go. I hope it will go ahead. No one knows what's going to happen between now and then, but hopefully it's going to go ahead. Make sure you check out their social media, Instagram and Twitter. Thank you for watching. Keep staying safe and I'll catch up with you guys later. Thank you.